Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to today's Chief Learning Officer webinar, the CLO's Guide to a Modern Learning Technology Ecosystem. My name is Steve, and as always, I'll be here in the background to help answer any general or technical questions you guys may have. Before we begin, though, I would like to thank GP Strategies for sponsoring today's event. It's always a pleasure working with them, and we appreciate their ongoing support. And with that, let's get right to it. First, there is no dialing number for attendees. All audio will be streamed through your speakers or headphones, so please adjust your volume there accordingly. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a variety of icons. You will have access to all these tools throughout today's session, so feel free to customize your console however you would like. Among these tools, we have group chat, ask a question, resources, and certification. Please send your questions and all technical issues via the ask a question box by clicking on the icon marked Q&A, type in your question, and click, click submit. If you have a technical question, the answer will appear here. Any content-related questions for our speakers today will be read at the end if time allows. The certification codes for this webinar will appear in the certification box located to the right of your slides once you have met the required watch time. You can download today's webcast slides via the green icon labeled resource list. Don't forget, you can chat with your fellow attendees by joining the live group chat. And finally, you will receive a link to this recording of the webinar and a follow-up email, so please allow at least 24 hours after the conclusion of the event before the information is sent. And now, without wasting any more time, I would like to introduce our speaker for today's event. We have Matt Donovan, Chief Learning and Innovation Officer for GP Strategies. To get us started, Matt, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Thanks, appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Uh, glad to be here with everybody today. So look forward to talking about some things that are very near and dear to my heart. So as we're going through, obviously, if you guys have some questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. And time to time, I'll ask as we're going through, if there's some questions, we can also drop them in the chat as it's ongoing through these materials. Uh, but anyway, this is me on the screen here. You can take a look at it. I'm the Chief Learning and Innovation Officer for GP Strategies. Uh, it sounds like a nice big fancy title, but really what am I about? I'm really what I consider a human-centric design enthusiast. I believe that the learners and the humans, as we should be designing for, should be at the center of our designs, and that will definitely play out through our conversation today. And then I'm also identify myself as a recovering instructional designer. I've been a classically trained instructional designer in the field for uh, 25 years in this. And so I say recovering in the sense that we need to think slightly differently, evolve the way in which we think about designing or leveraging the technologies and the ecosystems to really create uh, what I consider meaningful and impactful solutions for our, for our learners. And then really looking at that aspiring multidimensional thinking acrobat, and that's the sense of being able to maintain multiple realities at one time. In today's world, we have so much change and transformation going on that depending on the context we walk into, we have different states of reality. So uh, as I think about that, it's like every day I deal with multiple realities that we're all struggling with. And that's, a, I think, a common shared view with a lot of folks. So jumping right into this, I do think it is important uh, to just kind of reflect again with what we're seeing. And this is, I know a lot of, for many of us, if you have kids here in, in, in North America, they're starting to look about reentering the school in the fall. And so what we've really been looking at it, that, that we have probably changed the educational system. We won't all go back 100% to the way it was. We've been forced to adopt more virtual and what I would say more collaborative approaches to it from from early childhood, kindergarten, all the way through higher ed and even into the corporate space. When you think about it, we were facing at the height of this, a billion learners globally have been moved out of the classroom and have been displaced. And when you think about that's a significant shift in the way in which we teach, learn, connect, and grow. And as we start to think about how do we return safely, uh, knowing that we're balancing the importance of that social and that collaborative interaction with our children and students and in the classrooms while also creating safe environments. So I wanted to just take a moment to reflect that there's a lot going on that's really shaping what we are going to be talking about today and what we're all personally experiencing. One of my favorite quotes, and I actually got this, um, first introduced to this in graduate school when I was focusing on systems and systems design thinking. Uh, but I think it actually coming forward has been really relevant for what we've been experiencing in the past six months, very specifically. 
and I've added to it. So it's attributed to Alvin Toffler coming out of his book, Future Shock. He talks about the illiterate of the 21st century. It's not really those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And many of us have had to definitely deal with that recently. But I would also add those who cannot connect, reconnect, and collaborate with others. So it's not just about being the continuous learner, but it's about being a connected learner as well and adding into that layer. And, and that's really where I think the, the confluence of design and technology come in. And the idea behind that technology is, is we increase our ability to be able to connect with others, to collaborate with others. It's important to remember it's about the human and the system and the place, and we're trying to enable more meaningful connections. Um, but it can also get pretty uh, chaotic if you don't plan for it well as you're going through it. We're going to talk more and explore that, but I really like that quote because it kind of helps me kind of recenter on what are we trying to do in our organizations today. It's not just create that continuous, but that connected learner as well. So taking a look at this, I'm, uh, many of you I'm sure have probably seen uh, the fourth industrial revolution, you know, following up with that kind of futurist thinking, kind of identifying the evolution and how work has taken place as you start from the 1.0 to the 2.0. And we're really kind of coming out of this 3.0 where it's really been around the mechanization, or, I mean, the um, uh, more around the, the, the introduction of computers and, and the online and the web. Moving into this 4.0, which is really the connected uh, nature of it, the uh, Internet of Things, and that's really what we're coming into. And it's giving rise to several things. When we think about the business, you're seeing it's giving rise to you know, the digital um, consumer. So if you think about the business side, the digital consumer, the digital enterprise, and then the digital operations. And then so from the learning side to kind of mirror that, what we're looking into is the rise of the digital learner the digital learning enterprise, and the digital learning operations. And what I'm really trying to call out the difference here is, is that uh, I think it's pretty straightforward when we talk about the digital learner, folks that are going through and creating meaningful and valuable learning experience, taking accountability for that, but, but we're going to wrap around them an enterprise, a system that makes it available so they can get to what they need, when they need it, when they need it most. And that's one thing, but it's also the operation sides are how are we taking data and information in order to actually not only prove that what we have out there in the enterprise is working, but also to improve it, to be able to drive into it and even extend it into getting into predictive behaviors, getting deeper into how we're actually enabling and uh, supporting them through the enterprise around that. So it's kind of bringing those three layers together in that learning system. And I think it's a really important way to kind of keep in our mindset is when we think about the role of technology in the ecosystem, it's really coming back to uh, not only provide that wraparound experience, we're taking the learning to them instead of having them come into the learning space. How do we get it next to them? But it's also about how do we actually know, learn what we know about them, their interactions with them, and help create something that gives a return on that energy and investment they've put in the system. I like to use one of the examples, and this is this is a, a personal example, which I think kind of sets a, an interesting benchmark for where do I think the the you know the digital learning organization, the enterprise and the operation sites where is where should it go? As and it's a simple example. And so, what I'm coming up here is, is a reference to um, a recent experience. So, like many people with the interest rates low, I've decided to recently refinance my mortgage. And I had a very different experience most recently when I went to refinance my mortgage than when I did the first time when, you know, 12 years ago when I was doing it. So almost in my, I had a 3.0 experience about 10, 12 years ago, and then I've had much more of a 4.0 experience recently. So let me tell you a little bit about that. So when I did my, my mortgage, the first time I did my mortgage, it was all about me leaving my world. I had to go to the bank. I had to bring in some paperwork, meet with somebody. They'd push me through a workflow. The human would make sure that I've got the documentation. I'd then have to leave, come back, schedule another meeting. Uh, and then ultimately I may have to you know, then schedule a third, which was the closing and the signing. And those all meant that I needed to kind of leave my life, go in and complete these tasks and activities. And the, the person sitting across me from the process was a lot more about, you know, manually pushing me through the process, telling me where I need to go. And, and the conversations were much more oriented around meetings. Now, I may have started the application online, but it was a very um, more manual process as I went through. 
Now, flashing forward to recently, what I just went through was a very different experience. And the reason you see that my phone is that in this experience, it shifted. So I was able to run the entire mortgage experience without having to leave my life. And, and what I mean by that, I was able to start the process, submit the paperwork. I entered into an actual digital workflow that kind of pushed me through the process. So it was, it was automated and had some light AI looking at gaps or recommendations on how I could, you know, what I needed to finish out as I was moving forward on it. But I had a human there, but their role really wasn't to drive the workflow. That person was to serve more as a coach. What questions did I have about the process? Uh, was I struggling with anything? Answering those outside questions around what's next in it, but I was already getting everything I needed from the workflow. So uh, this individual, my coach, was available for me on demand, very responsive, but they were there to kind of help me through difficult points. And so I was able to take the entire workflow in the process, and I was able to do that from my phone or from my home without having to leave and go into the bank and be able to do that. Even the closing in and of itself came to me, and we were able to do all that in, in my own location. So it, two very different experiences. So if you think about it as a benchmark for where we're going from the learning organization, how can we actually start to wrap the learning enterprise around the learners and performers without them having to leave their world to come in and always learn, what if we're able to wrap around and deliver not only the instruction and the information they need, but also the data that dashboards to make them, uh, let them make better decisions on where they need to go, what they need to learn next. So I like to share that as a, as a good example as being able to think as a, a different kind of way of how we're engaging our learners. The humans don't go away in the system, they just move up the value chain and still play a very valuable or critical role, but they're not the ones doing the manual process at the beginning. So, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. When we think about, you know, the traditional paradigm has really been disrupted. You know, we think of a, a common structure as looking at the work, the worker, and the workplace. And when you think about the work in and of itself, you know, it, it was it kind of had a shelf life. We came in, we knew what our job was. We were given the organizational was able to map out, here's the training you need, do this, complete this, then you're going to go out and do your job. And what we're finding is that the shelf life of, of a structured role or job is getting much shorter. And it's actually changing or evolving so quickly that it's really hard to kind of constantly be rolling out new training. So what the changes is now you see consistently or continuously evolving and changing in what the job is. And I don't know exactly what the job of tomorrow may be. I know some of the core skill components that are coming into it, but what the actual role of function may be may vary differently from what it is today. When you think about the worker themselves, historically, the relationship was you came in, we gave you the training as the organization, you then took the work, and then you went out the, the training, and then you went out and you did the work. And that was that was a relationship with the organization. Given to the change in, in the evolving, not only the, the environment, but also the skills that we need to be able to do this, learners are having to take a much more active process. They need to step in and start really owning their learning journey because it's too slow for the organization to figure out what the change is, plan the change, roll out that change out, get it done, and then have it ready to go. Because by the time you've gone through and prepared all the materials for the new system, the system has changed again. So the idea is that we have to bring in the workers into the learning system and they take accountability for that journey, which means we need to shift and teach them not only how to be able to do that, how to construct, how to think, how to take advantage, of the enterprise that's wrapped around them, but we also need to make sure that that enterprise is really set up with the affordance for them to easily be able to connect with and get what they need out of it. And then the last one is really looking at the, the workplace in and of itself uh, is only becoming more complex. You're, you're seeing that it is not only is it multidimensional in, in terms of skills, ability, business context being brought in to solve problems, but you're also looking at multi-generational as well. It has become more complex and the paths to how are you going to get peers for, for enablement or support or learning assets or, or learning components to help me get better at my job is just getting more comp uh, complex. And that's where, you know, the technology and the system can help do that with a really good design. You have a better chance of surviving and managing through this disruption. 
Now, many of you have probably heard about, you know, when we think about, you know, things for, you know, workforce of the future initiatives, future skills initiatives. Um, I throw, depending on your list, if you look here in the lower left and the lower right, you look at these are some common emerging skills for individual contributors. If you look at the manager and leaders, there's a set over there. Depending on on who you subscribe to, you know, some of these there may be ten. You may swap out a couple, but the idea is that there are definitely some new skills that are either gaining more emphasis or appearing for the first time in that list. But while, while that's important to understand those, those knowledge and skills that we've identified in the, in the lower left and right, what's really important is when we look at the core mindset, to calling those out. And when I look at the mindset, a mindset is something different than just the knowledge and ability. These are things that I would call enabling components. So when you have something like empathy, you can't just go out and create a really short micro learning module of 15 minutes and teach somebody about empathy and boom, they're more empathetic, they're able to do that. But empathy is a core component of being able to not only be an effective team member, it's, a, it's, it's an important contributor to things like emotional intelligence and, and, and being able to bring those skills forward. But empathy in itself takes time and energy and a very different approach to be able to build those things in. And when I talk about learning agility and ownership, for example, these are things that are new mindsets that require you to think differently, how you're going to solve problems, how you're going to connect with others. And these are very different approaches that we do. And I call them out differently rather than just kind of putting them in a list of the skills because you do have to think about how you tackle them differently. And that's where you use a variety of tools, techniques, technologies to be able to build and grow and reinforce that over time. The next layer that I think is really important to look at is, is that when we're kind of wrapping together building the new enterprise or bringing together the, um, you know, the, the, the operational components, you need to think about how you're actually going to meet the full range of, of moments of learning you need. So I'm going to tell you, I love the moments of learning need concept. I think uh, Conrad and, and Bob Mosher did a fantastic job with this. I think it's very, actually very performer centric. I love the system. It, it starts off with what do I need to know? When do I ne uh, need to know? And it really comes back to these core moments of learning need. Uh, and I really like what they're doing uh, around that. I think it's a great way as we start to think of a, a, a learning system, how we start to meet a full range of needs. We're not just focused on learning something for the first time, which is a lot of what we do historically in organizations pushing out for the first time, or maybe learning a little bit more about it, but we're really bringing in that performance enablement side of moments three, four, and five. And I think they're really important, but, but that I think is as a in the organization, being able to create learning journeys and learning experiences that actually encompass all five moments of need is absolutely crucial. Of course, because, you know, I've looked at it and, and a lot of conversations with clients and partners and folks and I kind of identified two additional what I call emerging moments of need kind of adding to this. And, and this is, well, the first five really look at, you know, the need for something has changed or something went wrong. Those are definitely environmental triggers that I that precipitated I now need to learn something. I wanted to call out the need to think about when you need to innovate or grow to a new role. So these are things that are intrinsically driven that happen before I have an environmental trigger that happens with that. And arguably, I think it's important that we think slightly differently about these because when we bring in tools and technologies like recommender engines for uh, learning platforms, uh, when we're bringing in you know, personalized learning paths, those are very convergent tools. If you like this, I'm going to give you more of it. If based on your skill set, I'm going to progress and, and get you to a performance mastery level by giving you what you need in a pathway. But if I need to innovate, I need more divergent pathways around that. So not only do we want to drive to critical importance but uh, of performance, but I want to come back and look at how do we innovate how do we drive, um, you know, that, that growth for the new role, that, that internal thing is how do I get to somewhere else I need to be? And we need to be able to create a system that enables those type of learners to find things that are less divergent, that they're connected but not 100% relevant to exactly what I have. How do I get things that are new and different, that inspire me, that push me in a different direction, allow me to think differently about things, challenge my biases, 
that's where you got to got to build in the innovation and the uh, you know the, the growth for the next role. Those are all critical in those spaces. Now, those five moments of need, what you're looking at is in to meet those ranges of those needs is that we need to think about the different roles that the learners take on. And this really gets back to the importance of social learning and how we kind of need to shape and help develop them into taking that, that key ownership in the process. So no longer is it okay just to be a consumer of learning or training in the organization. You need to step into the space and become a moderator, a curator, a contributor, uh, you know, and a collaborator, a creator, you know, it's somebody who's sharing you, they're actively in the ecosystem. They are actively contributing to it. When you think about, you know, moments three, four, and five, and then really pulling in innovator growth for new role, those are things where people that are actually in the ecosystem that are doing the job, doing the work, contributing it, help other people, other folks innovate, they're the ones that are really coming in by playing the role of moderator, curator. They're helping us meet those needs. It is really hard for the organization itself to meet all five moments of need without the learners taking a fundamental role in the, or in the experience. And that's absolutely critical for us to be in that space. But it's not just enough to think about the expanded learning roles, how they start to bring in the layer of social learning. The next, one, next layer is really thinking about from an organizational standpoint, what is the human infrastructure we need to have in place? So you think back about my mortgage example, we had a picture of, I, I call him Chad, I, I, it's not his real name, but Chad was my mortgage coach. He was able to help me through the process. Um, in a sense, he stepped into the ecosystem and played a different role than he had before. And this is when you think about a learning organization, um, thinking differently about the, the human connective tissue that really makes workforce transformation really hum. And, and these are roles that often do not show up on an org chart. Uh, they, they're people that are often influencers and have innate capabilities, but they don't necessarily show up in a hierarchical structure. In it. And so um, I do want to give really good recognition. This is kind of um, inspired by the work done from Rob Cross, who, who does a fantastic, he's got a fantastic body of work on, on the com conversation around collaboration in the workplace. And um, really uh, coming through with, um, you know, thinking about organizational networks and how we connect with each other. And Rob's got a really great model and a framework to think about that. Uh, as it goes forward, and, and, and I love that. But what inspired me is that on the learning side, as we look at our personal networks, the people that help me learn, help me develop, help me get better inside an organization, they've got these. So these are folks that I add, I call like within a function or a unit, there are people that I call kind of learning connectors. The people you go to when I don't know what I need, know how to do something, who do I call? Who do I help? Who can they connect me to a resource or give me access to somebody? We typically know who that person in the organization is, but they're part of that informal network or structure. So your learning connectors are kind of within that um, structure or that unit. Your, your learning bridgers are the ones that are going across the function, across the organization, across disciplines, bringing in new insights, new thoughts, new ideas into the group, making the connections across the different parts of an organization. So that uh, across a unit, you can get new ideas coming in, you can share ideas out, come up with new things, learn, and that really helps support around the innovation and the growth, for example. When you think about specialists for coaching and mentoring, this is like identifying who's really good at something. Who, if you want to learn how to do that, spend a day with that person or get some direct feedback. If I only had an hour with that person that knew this, identifying who those folks are, those coaching and mentoring, these are the people that are really skilled at it and can convey it to someone else. And what we often find is that the folks that are making those connections know who those people are and can help bring that across. And then the last one is, is really thinking about the information brokers. These are the ones that are bringing the data, the information, the access to the assets in the organization, bringing some of those things together in that overall learning space. And there's a lot that's kind of around this um, and this concept, but starting to look at the learning organization as it integrates in the business and how the work gets done, being able to know where your folks are who play these roles in the organization is absolutely critical. As a, as a business may expand or contract, if you firmly believe that your ability to transform a workforce, whether you're growing, changing, or contracting, 
that, that you're transforming to achieve an outcome. You need to be able to do that. These folks are the ones that really drive that engine and, and knowing who they are so you don't inadvertently cut a very strong enablement part of the organization or as you go to grow, you're not really growing and expanding in these capacities or you're not reinforcing these roles or identifying who they are. So it's an interesting aspect of starting to get and wrap around in your system who those folks are. The technology layer comes in and allows you to connect to who those folks are, identify tools um, that, that are able to come in and, 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 and rise those folks up, make them more visible in the organization. But it, it's the actual individual performance and the individuals in the organization that are really critical around that. And so let's take a look at the next one. If you were looking at the concept of relevance, now this is where I think it, it comes back. And so I'm shifting direction here a little bit, but relevance is really what I consider the coin of the realm, the thing that is most important. And it's probably one of the most elusive things. You know, and, and I've talked about that I have been a, a classically trained instructional designer for 25 years. I've created a ton of content, what I would consider some really fantastic learning um, experiences, events, things that have come out that have been, you know, I, I think really sound. But the question is, is were they always really relevant to what they needed to achieve or outcome? I wouldn't say that that was always the case. Was it instructionally sound? Yes. Could they learn from it? Could they take something away? But it was the right thing that they needed at the right time. And so I like the analogy. You've got a very, you know, uh, you know, reflective woman. She's out here in the middle of an ocean surrounded by salt water. The concept of content or water relevance would be the drinkability. That is getting back to making sure that in all of the assets and all of the information that we have out there that they really get what's relevant to them in their moment of need. They do have a fundamental role, of course, in nourishing themselves, but we've got to make sure that they have access to the resources to be able to do that. So we don't necessarily always need to bring the water to them, but we need them to be able to uh, enable and access that. And so thinking about that from a relevance standpoint, I often refer to what I call as three layers of relevance. There may be four or five. I'm sure that people can always expand on the model. I'm, I'm always open to innovation as we come. But when I look at this, and this comes up a lot in the way in which we talk about curated learning systems. And so I use a business exam, acumen example here at the bottom. When we think of the first layer of relevance in a business acumen case example. So we know that if you've ever been a business acumen course, being able to read a financial statement is absolutely one of the core abilities to do. Can you read the data about the organization and be able to do that? So you'll go out and how do I read an income statement? How do I read a cash flow statement or a balance sheet? Those are all important documents to be able to do. The first layer of relevance is what is it? What does one look like? When I get to the next layer of relevance, what's important is when you start to look at what does my organization's income statement look like? What does, where does the work I do, how does it roll into the income statement for the total roll up? That's different. And if you've ever taken just a general income statement and then tried to read your own organization's income statement, you know that the way it's structured and the way it's affected, there's a significant amount of, amount of change with that, that, that is very specific to what you're doing. And then the third layer is, is how do I then take information, either reading from an income statement to make a decision, wrapping it with a, a decisioning model, and then other points of data to actually make a business decision, or be confident that if I make a business decision, how would it actually show up in the income statement? That's really kind of that third layer of relevance. The reason I call this out is that in many ways, we look at technologies like curation platforms, um, and they are very powerful tools and they're really important, but sometimes, we look at the experiences if we're just going to curate a bunch of content that has the most amount of portability to it, which is generally at the first layer of relevance. But in really to hit it, you have to hit the second and third layer, really allowing the learner to take it into how is this going to deliver and drive outcomes, transfer, affect the business outcomes. You need to be able to go all the way to that. And when you're curating and you're taking a strategy between you build some, you curate some, you borrow from some areas, you take some inspiration as you're kind of creating your, your overall learning experience. The idea is that you know that as, uh, you're going to have to put some energy and effort into really crafting that layer, that second and that third layer of relevance. Where, where the important part here that I'm trying to do is that instead of spending all of our time and energy on the first moment building all of those assets, there are tons of great assets, for example, on how to read an income statement. I don't need to recreate that. 
But when it comes to how do we read hours, how do I draw insights from that? How do I make business decisions using that as a data endpoint? That is something that's unique to the performance application within that space and being able to capture that for the organization, being able to incorporate the learners and the performers and those that may have recently gone through the experience and are now applying it to be able to feed back into it. That's where you start to see that the, 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 the peers, the uh, more recent performers coming through are able to actually feed into delivering those layers of relevance. And it really starts to come back and drive I think some of those key concepts. Now, I do think it is really important that when we get in and think about the concept of, of blended learning coming around a digital learning journey, and now digital learning journey definitely brings in the components of technology with it, but we do think about blending different. So the concept of blended learning has been around for probably about 20 years, maybe a little bit longer. I forget when the actual term came about. I mean, we've probably been blending under the really old school distance learning for a while, but for the most part, I would say there was when you started to add in like a, like a WBT or a web-based component, maybe a little bit of a live component. But the concept is, is the old definition of blended learning was a lot more like a toss salad. And what I mean by that is when we blended them, they, they came together to create something that, that could be effective, but each individual component was its own thing. I could still take the WBT out and it still stood by itself. I could take out the ILT components and that would stood by itself. I could take the job aids and they kind of stand on their own. But when we think of the true blended learning for the digital learning journey, it's more like a smoothie. And the idea is that when you're bringing all of the assets into this experience, they are actually combining in a way that is actually able to create something more than just the sum of its parts. And that's where I get into the concept of a toss salad versus a smoothie. It's a new approach or a new way of thinking and how we start to really blend our digital learning experiences. So we're trying to not only get across the enterprise, we're integrating some of the elements of the operations using data intelligently, going from a dynamic learning system to a smart learning system. We're actually now taking in the connected points between you know, the micro learning component to the social learning components, and they're all coming together to create a, a truly integrated experience. And, and I think when I talked about becoming a recovering instructional designer, this is fundamentally another dimension of that new way in which we need to think about how we design. It's bringing in new disciplines, the concepts of user experience, um, the concept of data analytics. How do we use the right, you know, capture, collect, and draw insights from data for ourselves as designers or pushing it out to performers and learners? So there are new dimensions that are coming into this, and this is from a design standpoint one of the new things that we're really blending into that. Um, one other thing I think it's a really new concept is in that new design component we have in here is I also talk a little bit about the concept of negative space which comes more from the art world. So in the art world, when you think about, you know, putting paint on a canvas, you know, it's important to think as much about the negative space. It's not just as important as the, the paint you put on the canvas, it's what you don't put on the canvas. It's the combination of that that's important. And when I talk about designing for negative space, we need to be able to create in our designs room for the learners to step in and take accountability. We need to have space where they can go in and own the experience, draw their own relevance, connect with others, create part of that unique experience that they're bringing forward. That's another element that really comes into us, and it, it's something that is very counterintuitive to a lot of, I think, traditional designers have been brought into this or the way in which learning organizations have been brought in. We have been more focused on what we produce, what we build, the end-to-end -end narratives that we go through. If we think about the success or failure of like a WBT is, is whether somebody could get through it, they could find the next button, they got all the way through it, they clicked close at the end, hopefully they learned something, maybe they took a little test, but that was it. In the new design of a world of for digital learning, the learners themselves are a critical component of it, and you need to say it's, it's most important of what I don't put into it, what I create space for, is just as important as it is for what I actually put in the end-to-end -end journey. And, and I will tell you, not all struggle is bad. Growth is painful. It is new. Learning things is not easy to do. But 
when you're actually accomplishing and moving through it, it's a necessary part of the process. And so you, you can strategically bring in and leverage aspects of emotion and ownership and bring those into designs, and that's critical, being able to have that and create that space. But it fundamentally starts with the expectations that the learners, again, will be taking um, accountability for their learning journey. So again, this kind of brings in that new blend of learning. So all of this is up to this point we're talking about, blend, you know, the blending, the relevance, the roles in the organization, they're all setting us up for how do we think now about the actual technology ecosystem. And so I've organized the technology ecosystem from an organizational intent layer. So uh, there are other folks who have, have, you know, really informative models that look at this slightly differently. I've decided to take more of a, an approach from an organizational intent. What are they trying to get out of the platform? So when you think about the first layer here under the point of learning side, so this is the learning ecosystem. When you look at it, this is where are the learners going to go in order to get the information they need at that first point. When I want to learn something, where do I go? You know, historically it used to maybe be the LMS. Now we're seeing more where you have curation platforms being the portal and the, and the architecture for being able to bring in a range of learning experiences that wrap around that or some organizations are actually creating these um, dynamic HTML5 portals, which are skins that layer over the whole ecosystem. But where it is, is one of the first questions is, is, you know, where are they going to go? That central point of access, when I need to learn something, where do I go? When you look at the next one, it's really how are they going to connect with it? And there's so many different ways that I can now interact with the ecosystem. I can have my own mobile device. I can have a company uh, owned or, or provided device. I have a laptop or a desktop unit. I ha may have wearable technologies, whether it's, um, you know, it, it could be a watch, it could be a heads-up display, it could be a variety of things that you have around there, but there are many more ways in which folks are now interacting in the ecosystem. It's important that you understand how they're going to interact with the system, but most importantly, you want to create things that are responsibly designed that you build it and it can actually play across or be portable across all of these different accessibility points. Measurement and analytics. I've got a layer here that takes a look at saying how will you know when something's working so that you can be able to prove that it's working or improve it as you're going or feedback data to the learners so they can self-adjust as they're going through or to the business stakeholders so they get insights as part of the system. There's this whole layer that's important from the organization of mapping to how do we actually track that? And it's more than just looking at the, you know, four or five layer, whether you're Kirkpatrick or Phillips uh, aligned in whichever camp you are, but you definitely want to look at, you know, you know, what's the experience? What was the overall with that, that level one, level two? Did they actually master the content? Do they know it? Could they pass a test? You know, really, that, that's that base layer. Then you get to level three and four, which is looking at transfer. Did they actually take it back to the workplace or getting into it on that return on investment? Was the investment and did it really get back to us? It's more than just looking at those systems or saying that I have those. The, the real thing is that while the frameworks and the models, Kirkpatrick or Phillips, talk a lot about what you need to measure, they don't talk about sustainability. How do we actually get ongoing data so we don't have to stop and spend $50,000 to figure out whether our $125,000 initiative worked or not? The idea is how can we start to build into our ecosystem a way that we can actually pull data and get that on an ongoing system to know what's working? Then you bring in things like experience and engagement data across the LXP, the learning experience platforms, the connection points out there. How are people engaging? There are so many platforms, and we'll see in the next layer, across all those points, there are many pieces of data we can actually track, which are naturally more insight into the progressions, the efficacy, uh, the confidence. There's so many points that we can bring into this. Then you have the adaptive platforms where you're able to create personalized learning paths based on your competency uh, in, in an area. You'll be able to now focus instead of on an exposure strategy, you're going to a, a competency. And so if I am if I'm less competent than my peer, my peer may progress faster through it than I do. They're getting a personalized learning journey. There's some really great things, but that has a lot of data that you can pull into that, not only looking at first-time learning, but you know, over time, how do they retain it? At what point, how many months, weeks later, did they start to forget that before application came in? There are ways you can pull new data points in it. 
And then the last one on the right is really thinking about the analytics layer of how do you bring all the data from not only the learning, the learning X LXPs, all these different points, and then wrapping it in with critical business data to really, you know, inform what, what I consider evidence-based business decisions. You're now using data to draw insights, and that's where it goes from being dynamic in many ways to being smart in an organization. Um, the next one is really the experience layer, and this is where you've seen a lot of growth and, and um, expansion, you know, with, with new types of platforms out there. You've got learning paths, digital learning paths. You have what I'd go cohort-based learning, which, you know, some people call as a MOOC. Um, I think it's actually the MOOC has uh, evolved a lot to, to a much more precise, powerful tool than it, than it had been historically when it started. I mean, it's been around since... I believe the 80s as a concept and it has definitely evolved uh, dramatically over the time. The use of a chat bot or um, AR, VR or mixed reality where you're bringing in uh, augmented plus virtual reality into a learning event, social elements, gamification. There's a lot of things that really blow out, the, but this is all about the experience and the journey and others that are coming through on this. So there's the experience layer. And this is where the analytics is looking about how do I pull the right data across each of these? And these are really powerful tools that are giving us insights that historically we just haven't had access to. The next one is this is inside the organization, your content management, or as I like to call it, your content engagement strategy. Where are you gonna develop and author and publish? How are you going to serve it up from a multimedia standpoint? So it's bandwidth friendly, it's accessible at the point I can get to it, it's where I need it. Um, you know, I look at, you know, digital asset management. How do I actually have all the assets I have out there? How am I actually managing the life and the evolution of those? How do I get to be able to repurpose and reuse them across the multiple points of application? You know, I, I can use them in different points to meet a range of moments of learning need. So for example, a new employee onboarding program may have some insights or application, but it's set for a new hire. I may take that without the, all the context around it and maybe actually a support piece later on uh, to meet a moment three, four, and five down the road. So you think about that and says, how do I structure my creation of my assets to be reu reused across a range of moments of need, across a range of platforms? And then the next layer is just really looking at the, this learning assets. And this is the atomic building blocks of the overall ecosystem. These are the things that you recombine and put across here. And, and again, what you're looking at is for portability, playability, all of those things so that it can be reused and consumed with intentionality across the overall ecosystem. Now, what I've just gone through, and I know there's a lot in here, and a lot of folks ask me, I said, you know, why don't you simplify this, you know, make it easier for people to look at it. I said, you know, what I wanted to do is to make sure that people understand that it is more complex than it ever has been. You know, I'm trying to drive with, as an organization, how do we use these technologies to drive an outcome with it? But the fact of the matter is, is it is more complex than ever. You know, if, if we had taken a snapshot 10 years ago, this would have been a lot thinner, a lot fewer blocks behind that. Now, before I go on here, I, it is important, the caveat is that I am not saying that an organization needs absolutely every one of these. You don't have to fill in every block. The idea is from an ecosystem is to understand what you need and which ones are important for you, what you have, and as you look at a roadmap over time, how you may strategically add to your ecosystem, making sure that they play well together. The importance is not just what's in the boxes, but it's really the, the organizational design around the technology to make sure that you're getting the connective tissue between these parts. That's really where the strategy comes in, is how do you bring all these pieces together? Now, what's really exciting is on the right-hand side, the point of work. So a lot of that was about the point of learning, and this is where we've seen a lot of great expansion. In the upper right-hand corner, I talk a lot about uh, collaborative workspaces, for example. There are a lot of things in that space, but probably many of you are familiar with like Slack or Microsoft Teams or probably two of the bigger ones, just as an example for what they are. But if you think about a Microsoft Teams, it's a place where people come together they collaborate around a project or an initiative, and they're able to do it. But imagine if instead of having to leave my collaboration space and go into the learning space, if all my learning poured it into the point of collaboration. So let's say, for example, I have a team that's going to be employing Safe Agile as a strategy. We're going to run a project or an initiative that employs that. I could, in advance of setting up the, the kickoff date of the project that begins a month from now, 
I can actually start to build the collaboration space, wrap the team and the team members with the assets, the refreshers, the resources in the collaborative space, things that will help them get to this or access to remediation if they need to build things up. But now I'm designing at the point of work. And that's where you think about the point of learning is that when I leave to go in that side cycle, I can also bring it directly into the point of collaboration. You have the actual work platforms, which are important. It's like where, where I'm doing my work, whether it's a sales call, planning tool, or something else. I'm wrapping you know, support into the work platform, kind of moving down the list. My HCM suite, where I'm looking at skills and skills analytics and things like that, and really making sure that I've got that growth across roles as we're moving forward. External sites, because we know that we don't have all the answers inside our organization. And then the last one are really beginning access to the work specific pieces. But this is the overarching larger ecosystem. It's become more complicated. But what's important is, as an organization, from a learning leader standpoint, is, is that not only do you understand, need to know really who you're building for or architecting, but the strategy itself needs to drive to the key tenants that I was talking about, as well as understanding the overall how the technology in and of itself. Without a good strategy, the technology doesn't really help. It, it, the tools have to be applied. They have to be brought together to be connected. You can still have some outcome with them, but if you're not really maximizing or optimizing their use, you're missing out on part of that critical return on that investment. Here's another way that we kind of look at this as, as a learner-centric, is another view that when you think about a modern learning journey, I've kind of got you know, the micro, the social, the spaced, all the things from learning research that we know make really good uh, learning systems that, that come out. We know that you know people tend to learn, retain, and ultimately transfer better when we design to this criteria. But what's more important is we think about how do we start to use technologies to meet a range of needs. So this is just one example of how you could use it, but it starts with the learner and what they need to get out of it. In this case, I've got Sarah here on the left, and how I might be able to, I might be able to use technology tools or platforms to meet a range of her needs throughout her learning journey across the five plus two, you know, those moments of learning need that are coming across. Wanted to kind of call out here some best practices, you know, to help the learners thrive in that overarching system. Again, it's really begin with that learner-centric mindset. You want to design for the ranges of moments of learn and really those expanded learning roles, those both the roles they take as well as the enablement roles we talked about. You want to leverage the technology appropriately. Know what you're using the tools for, what the intended outcome for those. Make sure you get the good connective tissue across them that feed out, uh, that support the overall organizational strategy. Help them connect, reconnect, and collaborate around new mindsets, new knowledge, new skills and abilities. But it, it's really thinking about that multifaceted approach. And not only does the knowledge, skills, abilities, but really getting into those mindsets, which pay dividends for the future of, of transformation and changes, the, the onslaught of change in the future that we haven't even seen yet. And then the last one is really blend it like a smoothie. And the blend it like a smoothie is looking at the technology, the design, and the components. Now, I did pull in one example. You think, hey, so what does this thing look like? What could it look like? Here's an example. And I've got Sarah. You saw her over to the left. And so how could I start to really think about creating both the technology and the design system around emotional intelligence. And I'll tell you, this is not the only way to design this. I think it's effective, but it's not the only way. And actually, you know, you'd want to go back and figure out your target audience is really your personas to really drive this. But this is an example that brings it in. And what it is is that the little, the purple dots around this are, are great ways to look at, um, you know, ways in which I could put something in place and really help her meet her needs as she's going through to learn about emotional intelligence in an organization. So she's on the job, she's working, she maybe wants to grow for a new role, she knows that emotional intelligence is an important component of it, how might she learn about it? We've created a bit of an ecosystem for her in here. Here's what her journey may look like. And so, for example, you know, it comes across, it starts off, maybe she sees an advertisement either online or it pops in her you know, on the homepage or a place where she sees regularly in the workspace or maybe in the physical space, she sees a poster here on the left and she can actually hit a QR code or she can put an augmented reality that pops up more information about, learn more about in, in, emotional intelligence. Here's what we have available for you. She can go in and look at some micro learnings or some micro videos from, from fo folks that talk about it or sharing concepts. 
she could take a preliminary diagnostic, a very small one that she could go into, or she could take a, a deeper diagnostic down the road that may be attached to a specific learning journey down the path. She could do that. She could download 30 days of activities for emotional intelligence. So she could, you know, download Outlook activities for the month, and each day she gets a micro-commitment or micro-activity to try a new dimension of emotional intelligence. Um, she has access to job aids and articles and tools and techniques, and she can also then go down and even, uh, you know, engage in a cohort-driven experience where she can work with others to really bring in that empathy mindset as it feeds into emotional intelligence, being able to take a, a spaced cohort-driven experience that I share with others to grow in the role. The point here is that she has a range of these things available for it. We've set the ecosystem up to kind of feed and meet that. But Sarah's the one that takes the ownership for the journey. She gets what she needs. She gets the commitment. She's able to expand through it. And we're wrapping around it a whole other range of, of support personnel to help Sarah. Sarah's like, hey, I want to learn more about this aspect or this dimension. Do I have somebody in the organization that she can help me? Hey, here's another resource. Try this out. Think of it as like a learning librarian. There's a human out there or, or a peer who may be going through the same thing. Could she get connected to that? Or we use a mentoring platform that, you know, thinking of like blending uh, like, like Match.com with mentors in an organization where Sarah's you got this background, she's trying to learn about this, wants to do that. Can she match me with a really good mentor in the organization? And it kind of uses the algorithm to make really good pairs and matching and then it sets them up. So these are the things we can bring together in the overall system. And I think kind of as we go into some questions, I want to make sure we've got a couple minutes here left for some questions. I think the critical consideration here is that as we think about the way in which we're integrating tools, technologies, and methodologies around that, I love ending kind of on the dimming quote. You know, it is not necessary to change. Survival is not mandatory. And it's really kind of the call to action as we go out there and start to create and build and bridge these new ecosystems that, that it is important for us to grow because if we don't solve these problems for ourselves, they will be solved by somebody else. So anyway, I wanted to open it up. So Steve, I don't know how we're doing on the Q&A side. Uh, hopefully, we've got some good questions out there. Um, I would be glad to kind of revisit the slide or talk back about, uh, with that, but any questions so far? Yeah, no, we do have some coming in. and. Uh... Uh, please, audience, feel free to uh, take this time to submit your questions, uh, anything content related. We have more than enough time to get through as many as we can, uh, and Matt's going to be more than happy to do so. So we'll get right to it. First question says, your comments on relevance bring up, wait, sorry, here we go. Your comments on relevance bring up for me an, an ongoing question. When is it better for learning experiences to be designed by a professional ID and when by the SME facilitator who knows his or her audience at a deeper level than ID analysis allows? Oof. Wow, that's a, that's a great question. Boy, that's an, that's an a big one. age old tension. It is. It's the age old tension between the designer and the SME. And I will say that both need to evolve in their roles, and I think both are critical to the equation. But the one thing is, is that the things that are very valuable for the subject matter expertise is they know a lot about it. They've already processed through the five moments of need. They're already down the path, but they may not remember what it's like to not know that or, you know, what do I not need? Because I can't learn everything at the first moment. So where the designers and the SMEs come together is to separate out what's the critical, what do I need to know? What's what do I need to know at some other point? What do I need to know now? What do I need to know at some other point? And then what's really nice to know that's open for remediation or reference down the road. So the idea is that in that design, it's a shift to go from this is exactly what we're going to tell them versus this is what I need to have. A real quick example on that is I worked on a course around uh, design of experiments. And I, it was in a, for a pharmaceutical company in the manufacturing space. The concept is, is that there are business stakeholders who benefit from working with st statisticians to create these designs of experiments to, to learn and gather data and make informed business decisions about that aspect. The thing is, is that when I was working with the subject matter of the, uh, the, the statisticians, they were adamant that my business stakeholders need to know how to calculate a z-score. And, and the argument I push back is that just because that's the way you learned it, it was important for you. 
a business owner that it's either going to consume results from you or put them in it may need to know what the concept is but not know how to calculate it. That's not necessary for them to be able to do it. There's, if they ever needed to refer to it, to go to a table. But I think it gets back to that balance between the designers need to really drive to that new role to help separate out the, the critical must know, the nice to know, and then space that over time. We don't need to know all of it in the beginning. Are there ways I can feed it in and create other ways for the speech to share that knowledge at different points upon the learning journey or on demand as the learners have that moment of relevance? So it, it is important to be able to cite, cite that. So, you know, I, it, both are important, um, but, but it's not an either or because I think designers without expertise uh, definitely have some holes in it. And I would say subject matter experts without the ability of, of somebody to look at it through the lens of a le learner and a consumer who knows what it's like to not been in that in depth is, is critical. Right, right. We'll go uh, right to the next one here. Does uh, can point of access be multiple or should it be a single point of access? Uh, I, you know, what I, what I think the best practice is when you have the clarity amongst all the noise that we have in the, in the systems that we have around here, if I can get down to the least number of points that I start my learning journey from, if I can get to a starting point that, that provides more clarity with it. You know, I know realistically that organizations may have, you know, a federated structure and they have, may have multiple points where they, for their population, they may have a different one. So it's not an absolute rule, but the, the thing that's best is the fewer, the better to provide a clarity of where do I need to go when I need to find something, the more centralized, the better. All right, good. So uh, sticking to that topic on the learning journey, we have one that says, as we are all remote, teamwork collaboration is made more difficult, but is more important than ever. Can you speak to where virtual team learning fits along that learning journey? Oh, absolutely. I think it's a really big part is when you start to look at, especially when I was referring to that collaborative workspace and the integration of learning into that, learning as a team, learning as a group, wrapped around the actual production of work, it's fascinating. That's where we need to go. I think it's really important for us to do that. But your point is, is, is well-intentioned in the sense that we transactionally, it's hard to grow as a team. Sometimes the digital and the distance can get in between us being able to collaborate and, and connect with each other. So I think it's where you have to be very purposeful about when and how you bring those moments of, of connection and collaboration. Uh, together. And, and I think it is really important to have those live moments where we do come together versus the semi-synchronous, which is a blend of same time, we're on at the same time, or we're on near each other, adding and contrib contributing to things. There are designated points where we come together, we collaborate, we think, we learn together as a group and using uh, tools. And that's where we've seen like the rise of a whole new set of virtual collaboration tools. Um, for example, if you think of Mural uh, is an example of, of one um, that, that is out there that allows us to do, you know, uh, you know sh collaboration and sharing of ideas and, and tools. There's a whole range of tools that are really emerging to help us do that. But when, you know, at some point when we're humans, we will need to still come together. There is good reason for us to be face-to-face -face if we can. I think in the future we're going to see more hybrid where we have co-located teams with virtual members trying to get to real-time collaboration with each other. And that's, a, that's an exciting growth around the tools and technology. We, we still have some good improvements to go, but I'm seeing some really interesting things out there. Great, great. Uh, we do have time for a couple more here. Uh, this next one says, are there standards across the learning ecosystem that help bring all of this together like you just suggested? Uh, there, I think there's guidelines. When, when I get to standards, it, it's, it's around trying to get to predictable problem solving versus predictable solutions. So getting back to some core guidelines which you follow. And, and you know, I vacillate between the word guideline versus principle. But, you know, first of all, starting off with the learner being at the center of the journey, the learner or the performer. So starting off with a learner centricity. If we don't know why or how they're what they're going to learn from it, how they're going to use it, how they're going to access it. If we don't know, we're missing a big part. So learner centricity is an example. Um, being able to accommodate a full range of, of needs to kind of come in, realize that we want them to be able to not only just learn, but be able to apply and perform. We want to do that. 
measurement. We want to be able to intelligently use data to, again, prove or improve what we have and put in place. And, and I think those are just three examples of principle or guidelines that whatever we're bringing together, it should be measured, should add to that overall picture, should start off with the accessibility and the intent of the in learner performer as a core center of that. Um, it, it should be ruthlessly relevant. I love that. Uh, it's something definitely been exposed to with our partners at Intrepid, but it has been a great concept around getting back to that that relevance image. So again, I think those are really good around that. So okay. uh, we do have time for one more. Uh, it says, does this architecture exist in federal government workspace? If so, who and where? <laughs> that is a great example, and I think we've actually had some very interesting, exciting conversations uh, around that. And so when we think of like the FedRAMP ecosystem of tools that are becoming more and more of these tools are actually starting to become available uh, in, in, in the federal space. So we look at tools that are more in that FedRAMP, uh, you know, as I, as I said, now not, not all of you know, not all of the governmental institutions, apply, uh, governmental institutions apply to that, but they start to set around the same kind of core criteria around security, accessibility, those kind of things. So it is growing in that space, but it has definitely been one that's been slow because there's such a fundamental, you know, not imperative, which is very important around safety, security, accessibility, all that's important, but I am seeing some really good conversations around that. Um, actually, one of the CLO of the year, I believe last year, was from the Defense Acquisition University. Uh, James does a fantastic job of really starting to think about how that ecosystem starts to change and evolve, and they're doing some really interesting stuff in that space. Um, you know, just a really sharp team out there. That's just one example. So it is growing. Uh, but but it is they are on a path in their own maturity curve around that across I'd say a lot of the, the government space. All right, great. Well, thank you so much again, Matt. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today's webcast. Uh, like I said, I want to thank Matt again for taking the time to present all this great information with us. I want to thank everyone in the audience for continuing to support and join us here for Chief Learning Officer webinars. And finally. Thanks again to our proud sponsors and good friends over at GP Strategies for sponsoring today's event. We will see you all back here for our next Chief Learning Officer webinar, how learning platforms have become the heartbeat of the remote workforce. Thank you place tomorrow, September 10th at 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Stay safe, everyone, and have a great day.